I can only advise what we should be doing. Someone's got to sign the check. You can't do that. And I said, well, we've got it. That's our job. The biggest thing I've learned is... This week on High Performance... Sean Dyche. That rawness, that, that, mm. that simplicity of the, you know, the old boxer in the first ring they're yeah. ever fighting. But how do you bring that back to them? Some of these managers come out, best managers, you know, they're all tacticians, and yet you find out, all oh, they don't run them to death. And I know other managers who you think, well, I'm not quite sure of that. But they're winning. Imagine how many people in nine and a half years I've heard say, we're going to play the right way and do the right thing, and then they get sacked. I mean, it's, you're talking hundreds. Isn't the right way winning games yeah, of but football? that's the big debate, isn't it? When your team's put 500 million and ours is worth 50. They're yeah, not yeah, the same yeah. apples, you know what I mean? You are going to be put into a situation where people go, oh, we presuppose that you are that. But you can't keep managing the Premier League if you don't know what you're doing. Trust me, you can't do it. Just take a breath. Call your jets. Take your time. Just let people revert back to being normal, not this newness. Now where are we going to take it? Well, I can't preach development and then not develop myself, can I? I go, no, they've asked me to do this I was going yeah that's your job so do it I was perfectly stimulated I'm looking around my group going right who's going to come with me James Tarkowski he was right on it are you refreshed are you though you might look it but are you when I'm ready to go back in I am ready we're really ready and are you ready now Listen, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our new subscribers, but you know, most people that watch this content on YouTube don't subscribe. I want to change that. The more subscribers, then the more amazing we can make high performance. And I've had a lovely message actually from Rob who says, I only recently discovered the High Performance channel and I watched the full Eddie Howe and Tyson Fury interviews, both some of the best content I've seen in the last five years on YouTube. Listen, if you agree and you want to keep this amazing stuff coming for free, then hit subscribe right now thank you so much sean what is your definition of high performance Oof, uh, i think there's so many in my case it's maximizing the ability of others whilst maximizing yourself you know because you're well if you're leading it if you're a manager coach or whatever your role is then you are pushing them for more um but whilst you're doing that you've got to ask more of yourself in order to find that balance i think so um I mean, there's many others, but that would be my feel on it rather than a um, definition like a dictionary definition. That would be my feel on it. And we're sitting here now talking three or four months after you left Burnley. So are you working on maximising yourself? I left, I left cruelly sacked. Yeah, cruelly, cruelly yes. Cruelly sacked, <laughs> of course. <laughs> cruelly sacked from Burnley. Cruelly sacked, yeah. Um, we could talk about that now, or we can talk about working on yourself. What would you like? Which road should we go down? No, no, no. Whatever you choose. Burnley, um, massive part of my life, yeah. massive part of my family, everyone's lives. Really, players, staff, the community of Burnley. We got no gripes about it at all. Really, um, the last three or four months, obviously, we didn't win enough games. So I've never hidden that fact. Lots of other reasons that I think could have been put in place, or could have been. Um, looked at differently to allow us a better chance of that happening um, but at the end of the day the job is to win games and we didn't win enough games and I felt we had a team that was capable so very quick view I'm not going to let three or four months of where it fell away a bit kind of smother over the previous nine or so years which were amazing so you know that won't happen and, and I'll always have massive respect for Bernie and all the varying people and different players that I worked with during my time there so when we interviewed uh, Frank Lampard, John, he spoke about the experience after Chelsea being dismissed there. It was almost like a grieving process that he went through. Have you experienced anything similar? Do you know what? I think I think everyone's different, though. Everyone's got their own feeling about that sort of stuff. I've never really been like that. I've never, you know, I remember being a player and you come out of clubs. I mean, I had a pretty healthy rapport with most of my clubs. I had a really tough time at Bristol City. Um, bad time really but I learned more about myself and about the profession than ever so actually reflecting on it it was a great period but it felt awful at the time yep. but I never really come out of any clubs I've always been quite realistic it's a business you know it's a it's a, it's a business I didn't come out of Burnley and it was like woe is me and that wasn't that's not the way I'm built you know I was like right we worked hard we had a go that's it like the last morning I just shook the players with the hands uh, shook the players by the hand and said right all the best lads but I got my stuff in my office off you go but I mean, in terms of like the relationships, after nine years, you've built relationships that are more than just professional, I imagine. And it's about how did, how did you find coming out of those kind of relationships? Yeah, but you only have a handful of them. You know, you can't be you can't be busy mates with every single player you've dealt with, every single staff member. You kind of build a professional report. It's like being a player. I was a player all my life. I was a player since I was 16. Yeah. Well, you end up your career, right? And I played at what, six different clubs, including Luton on loan. How many players, I have no clue, but lots, uh, hundreds, hundreds. And you end up with probably a hardcore of probably 
five, maybe seven or eight, maybe 10, who you keep in regular, you know, proper friends right. who you keep in regular touch with. And they'll always be there, you know, other than your, you know, like most walks, it's that weird thing about football, particularly you see someone, it's like you saw them an hour ago, but you know what I mean? Ones who you're hardcore, you keep in touch with them and you'll probably keep in touch with them forever. There's only so many football management's like that. You know, some players you'll build a, a really healthy connection with for whatever reason, it will just strike a chord with you and with them. Like Kieran Tripper is my obvious one. You know, I've always had a, a, a link with him. A few others down the years, you know, from back in the day, sent me messages and stuff like that. But not everyone can be your best mate, you know, so they're like a respectful friend and, and people have done well for you and hopefully you've done well for them. So let's talk then about the importance of this period for you to be able to reflect on how things ended at Burnley. Like you wouldn't be doing yourself justice if you didn't really delve into what happened and think, right, what could I do different? What was out of my control? How do I avoid certain things happening again? So how do you now reflect on it having had a bit of a break? Well, the, the obvious thing um, was... You know, what people have got to remember about Burnley was to a, yeah, probably the beginning of the pandemic, actually. The club was being sold behind everyone's eyes, you know, and that, that was a really tough period because you need players. You know, we all know that. You need to stimulate a group of players, not just you, your staff, new players, new people coming in. And they weren't prepared to do that, you know. And with all due respect, one of the summers, you know, we brought in um, down seams from, from Brighton for like 750000 That's your summer spend. I mean, Premier League, that's... That's very difficult to do that every year. And we'd done that a couple of years. We hadn't invested heavily. So I knew the team was going to hit a wall at some point. Yeah. Told the new ownership that the next couple of years are going to be really tough because I thought it was going to be, not because I was being negative, just because I believed it was going to be. And do they then think you're being negative, do you think? I don't know. I mean, you, you can't you can't always um, put your finger on that. You know, people, you, you use words and people will absorb it in their manner and they'll adjust the story accordingly. So... I've just always got to call it positive realities. You know, at the end of the day, why I'm not I'm not that guy who's going to say, yeah, yeah, it's all going to be rosy, they're all going to be brilliant. And I'm going, no, this is probably going to be the truth of it. We're going to work beyond it. In-house, don't forget. In, you know, this is private with your, your ownership or your, your real top staff, not with everyone yeah. involved. Mm. Um, but I just always thought, you know, the, the, the reality is the, the thing to work on. Um, and then the positive bit is when you take it out to the world and go, right, no, these are good players or whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're good players. We can make the best of this situation and all these challenges and all that sort of stuff. But there still has to be a reality line, I think. So I think I was building on that. So the biggest picture that I couldn't affect, actually, so I'm not copping out of it, but, it, you know, I can't write, I can't sign the checks. You know, I can only advise what we should be doing. And that's really frustrating sometimes as a manager yeah. because you know what you should be doing, but you need finance and available finance and they've got to, someone's got to sign the check you know you can't do that so i knew i knew it was going to be a tough period the ex-owners knew that but they were selling the club and they had you know lots and lots and lots of money and so i'm not going to go into detail but way more than you think was in the club that goes then into the new ownership they then reverse finance so then now they're looking at a different model you know for, straight from the off but you've got to be open-minded to work with that model and that's what i attempted to do was work within their new thinking and their new model whilst knowing that the, some of the players were just hitting that wall in that little down period when you think, right, how do we re-stimulate, you know, re-energise yeah. players who deep down, you go, they're, they're going just over that edge. It's a very difficult situation, actually, because although you're the manager and to the public, you're the kind of leader of that football club, you're suddenly totally powerless because, as you say, you don't write the checks. But you can also see it coming. Yet at the same time, you've got to go out publicly and say hey, we're going to be fine. We're, we're going to deal with this okay. Who do you turn to at times like that? Because I imagine that could be quite a lonely experience, actually. Yeah, it is. But you, you learn to deal with that because that's part of the job. You know, football management, you know, you, you, you've got to know what you're going into. It, it can be a lonely existence at times, but you, you get that, you know, and the more experience you get, the more it becomes like that. But you've got your, your immediate staff around you. Sometimes you have people outside the club who have been through it, the managers and that. You share a thought with them. You know, you might have your, your your team psychologist or club psychologist who's helpful with that sort of period, you know. I mean, I was reliant on my myself. I'm very open with my staff. We'd sit and have a morning meeting. We'd share a view on it. This is the challenge. This is what's likely. Or this is what I sense, you know, that's coming our way. What can we do about it? And at mm. times they get, you know, a bit... I remember once we had, um, we called it new manager thinking because everyone said, this is the group, we can't do anything about it. And I said, well, we've got it. That's our job. So yeah, I said, yeah. right, what would a new manager? You know, if I'm now a new manager... I've disappeared, new manager walks in, I guarantee you'd do something different. You would absolutely do something different. So I said, Brilliant. let's, I love let's that. make a list. So we did. We made a list, a literal list. I went, right, 
what are we going to do different? And we went bang and we started going through it. What was on it? <clears throat> Change the manager, the staff said. <laughs> so brilliant. Um, no, you know, some of the simple stuff you can imagine, um, let's take them out for a bit of bonding, whatever that may be. You know, the old school will be down the pub now, that's not so relevant, but I don't know, clay pigeon shooting or go-karting or sometimes just dinner, you know, a different dinner, take them for a walk instead of training, you little quirky things. Some were changing training times, some were changing the environment. We started painting walls and uh, getting different signage and not always big things, just little subtle cues, mm. just things that you catch, you know, and players, oh, you know, start remarking it, changing the presentations of the players before a game because we had a yep. pretty solid way of working, started changing things like that. That's it. Would you mind going deep on how you change that presentation? I think that's very well, interesting for business leaders that are listening Well, sometimes to you go to visual. So most people, as you'd, you'd both know, I'm sure mo most people are, are visual learners. So you, I think there's some stat about 60%, 65%, depending on your group, of course. We already do the the uh, psych profiles on them, the, the basic psych profiles, the learning styles and all that. I think we've discussed that before. So we already knew some of that knowledge, tapped into some of that, right? What can we give them that's going to stimulate them? Um, and then also stimulate the staff. You know, what are we doing? What are we, you know, are we looking at ourselves? What about changing ways of training, changing feel of training and all these types of things. So yeah, so we tagged it new, new manager thinking. And then we sort of went through that process a few times. I was there for nine and a half years. So this came up, you know, every few years when we were like, right, okay. And sometimes I would give you the opposite example was um, when we went into the Europa League, the, the game schedule, everything changes, but equally the players, it was the first time I saw Burnley players with that little bit of, you know, like yeah, I've yeah. arrived, you know. And I was right. like, whoa, hang on a minute. And we got to Christmas, 19 games, halfway point, and we had 12 points. So I went the opposite way and just stripped it all back and went, right, we've lost sight of what the reality of being at Burnley is, lads. And basically went back to hard work. You know, we can hide it all you want. I'll show you the stats. I'll show you the facts. Hard work brings an edge and that edge gets us results. And we went right back to basics. And the players bought into it and we finished the season and at 40 points or whatever it was, safe and very strong second half of the season. You know, didn't drew quite a few but didn't lose that many games you know so that was the opposite we didn't add stuff on we actually went no no we need to take it away we need to take we just felt it gone too far we'd given them too much now you know yeah. they turned into this well why haven't got this now i haven't got this now i haven't got that and i haven't got that and I, that's one thing i definitely reflect on i've spoken at a couple of different things over this summer period where many zoom calls and stuff with other people in sport and i said the biggest thing i've learned is be careful what you are giving them now because they've got so much now it's like, choose the right things to give them. Don't just go, oh, we'll give them more than everything. We'll, we need to reel some of this stuff in. And I think that's what I've learned for sure. Well, that's my opinion. You know, they can. You, there's so much out there now, which I know you both know, so there's so much and there's so many buzzwords and there's so many new yeah. ways of working. We've got so many new profiles. Da, 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 da. You hang on a minute, players are getting so much now it's like well I didn't have this 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 this, this and that's why I didn't play well <laughs> Hang on a minute. Yep. just get them into the dressing room so they're clear minded not adding 50 different things they've got to think about before they've even kicked a ball well I remember you telling us in our last interview Sean about the experience when you've been to the Oxford rowing crew yeah and the, it was literally a chalkboard with this is yeah. a, this is the date of the race this is what we need to do yeah before. I mean I, I didn't know I was going to find out some simple things like that but I went down there Sean Bowden very open I spent a day and a half with them but super open got there first thing in the morning well, you can see whatever we do um, just the most non-professional professional people I've ever seen you know what I mean but in the simplest format they hadn't lost sight of the hard work They're, they are doing the hard yards I yep. mean every inch you know coaching on the on the launch they call it you know in the boat and I mean you know in that period don't forget um the two Winkle Voss, uh, Winkle Voss brothers who went through the Facebook thing and got a kajillion quid, they were in the boat. They're flying backwards and forwards to America with all the lawsuit going on and all that. So, you know, a lot going on, but mm. they were driven. I thought, well, hang on, how do you sort of, how do you get that that connection with what, you, what you're trying to achieve? When, and don't forget they're doing PhDs and all sorts. They've got all sorts going on in their lives, but they're still getting up at five in the morning get their own rower out, get on the rower, here we go. You know, that that rawness, that that, mm. that simplicity of the, you know, the old boxer in the first ring they're yeah. ever fighting. But how do you bring that back to them? How do you make sure that's still in there? It's very but, difficult. But here's a question for you then, that like, <laughs> like the power of that simplicity is great. But so then if you utilise that, you also have the danger of you're badged as a dinosaur, that you're not embracing all these other new fads or buzzwords as well. So how do you, how do you find that sweet spot between 
keeping things simple and the clarity that you know works and yet still trying to pander to that modern mindset of feeling that they do need all these bells and whistles. Well, I, think, I think some of it, I think when, you, when you're when growing as a manager and you, you, you're getting a bit more um, recognised, is, is you leave that alone a little bit because you go, look, you're going to be put in your box. You know, look how I look, look how I sound. I'm probably going to live in a pretty simple box, you know, which suggests yeah. you just get on and you do that. But the players don't forget, you're looking at your players, they know there's more to it. Your staff know there's more work involved than what, what people would imagine. So that's good. You go, right, okay, who do I really need to worry about? Well, I need to worry about them. So yeah. that keeps you pretty level. Sometimes it only, it only gets in your skin when some of these managers come out, best managers, you know, they're all tacticians and yet you find out all they don't run them to death. You know, and then you just go, well, hang on, if that was me, I probably would get tagged with that. Yeah. But then the work still needs getting done. So you go, well, whether they're tagging you with that or them with that is irrelevant. The fact is the work still needs getting done. And you know, the biggest thing that clears any stories up is when you win and you win a lot. <laughs> so you yep. that, people buy into it. You know, there's people, there's really good managers and coaches. I've heard some great ideas from managers and coaches who I've nicked stuff from and I thought, you know, actually being very successful, that's a bit of gold there, but they can't sell it because they're not being that successful. And then I know other managers who you think, well, I'm not quite sure of that, but they're winning. So, you know, it can change the, the view of a, a point that is very relevant, and very useful, can change just from winning matches or winning, you know, whatever you do. It's interesting how um, football, football can be so disparaging of a certain style of play, even when it's successful. I wonder whether that's something that has frustrated you over the years. Like you don't manage 10 years at one football club unless you're a bloody good football manager. Yeah, it's another thing, you know, brands and all that sort of stuff, branding football, you know, the biggest thing, I keep hearing that word diversity all over here now around football, rightly so, obviously with a lot going on, you know, issues in life, diversity, diversity, and then all you ever hear from inside of football, if you are oh, the media view is, everyone should play the same way. We're all got to play sort of like Barcelona, let's say, you know, generalising obviously. Yeah. But, mm. And then you go, well, hang on, what's this word diversity then? How, how do you get a product that should be diverse and yet everyone's meant to play the way that sort of the media guide them to play. So yeah, again, I've never really resisted it because you go, my my view, and we we definitely have discussed this before, but I think it's a relevant point. If I've got to get the best out of you, I've got to come out of the format that will give you the best chance to be the best you. Yep. That's just, that's got to be logical. So I always look at it like that. And the best example, I mentioned him earlier, but Kieran Trippier, I remember saying in an interview, I said, Kieran Trippier can land the football anywhere on the football pitch. Honestly, he's got that much talent. But you want me to only allow him to play 10 yards? I said, I'm doing him a disservice. I'm actually taking away from his career by saying, no, no, I only want you to pass it 10 yards to that. Yep. So that's a, a version of, now if you've got a team of players, how do you give them the best chance of them being successful? Because every player wants to be successful, trust me. Of course, if you can do it by playing fantastic, amazing football, like a Man City doing that, well, that's fantastic. But not many can. And it's that really tricky situation now. And I feel for the younger managers because they're almost under pressure to tell the world they're going to play the right way. And then they're sacked within six months. And you go, imagine how many people in nine and a half years I've heard say, we're going to play the right way and do the right thing. And then they get sacked. I mean, it's, you're talking. Mm. Well, what is the right? Isn't the right way winning games of football? Yeah, but that's the big debate, isn't it? Mm. You know, now it's become winning games of football. We have to win it playing a certain way. And, and when, when, delicate, what do you say when people say, oh, it needs to be more entertaining, right? Sean? Well, entertainment still often revolves around winning. We're all incredibly entertained when your team's winning, trust yeah. me. And any sport, by the way. You know, I mean, it's, it's crept into rugby. You all know that. I don't know that much about rugby, but I know I've done a bit with Eddie Jones and a few of the rugby bit. And they're going, oh, no, no, we, we're brand, you know, the, the brand's coming in, you mm. know, more play, kick and kicking football, more play, skilled hands or whatever they call it. I don't know all the terminologies, but, you know, it, it does creep in. But the thing is, when we talk openly like this, I'm just trying to explain it. The bizarre thing is, at least when you can explain it, you listen, we share. But you do this in the media and guess what? Ah, see, you know, and you just get back in your box mm. again. Whereas actually, I'm just debating that there are more ways of playing. There are, does it make them all right or wrong? I agree with your point. How can you make it entertaining? That's got to be a point of principle. It always was. More so now, there's more demand for that. But I would argue it's entertaining having 400 passes in your own six-yard box. I'm not sure that's that much entertainment for me. I've, you know, I've been in football all my life. I love yeah. the game. I'm going, I'm not quite sure I want to watch that every week. Well, I was thinking of you, Sean, recently, because I knew we were going to meet. Yeah. And I was reading, have you read the book by um, Arrigo Sacchi, where he talks about that Milan period of the late 80s, 90s, and have, have you, it's called The Invincibles. Um, and he talks about having to come in where he was a... 
he wasn't a footballer himself and he was going into a dressing room of Hull and Van Basten and Baresi and he had to get them to buy into it. And he talked about his two principles, which was, one, we need to work harder than anybody else. And then his second one was, and then we need to win games. And then he structured his whole format. His philosophy was based on what he had around him. They were his two principles of working hard and winning. And then it was about, he didn't come in with a defined philosophy, if you like, beyond that. Well, I think I think they, the modern managers under pressure to come out with a philosophy. That's yeah. another key word. You know, everyone's got to have a philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think, you know, you're a dull hard unless you have a philosophy. I've never right, quite understood that. It's a game of football at the end of the day, by the way. Yeah. But I think there is that. Um, I think to use that word, I think you're under pressure to sort of, to, you know, put that out there before you've done anything. When actually the real, t- well, in my way, of similar thinking actually is that how do you know until you get in there and you know what you're working with? Yeah. Now, we can all imagine it's a bit easier, uh, not easier to get the outcome, but easier if you're walking into um, uh, follow Pep into Barcelona, right? They're all top. But what about and now you're at a Division One club? Yep. And you've sort of got to come out with a philosophy and you don't even know the quality of the players you're working with, but you're going to decide to tell whoever this is the philosophy. It doesn't actually make that much sense because in any other business you go in, find out what yep. is available, and then you'd go probably and present to the board and go, right, this is what I think. But in football, if you get what I mean, you've got to go out and tell them what you think when you yeah. don't even know what's in the camp. Well, that's a bit bizarre. You know, I, I can't see any more, I can't see much logic in that unless, like I say, there's certain groups of players out there. You you know, you you know they're gonna be top, really. So you probably could come out and say, We're gonna do this. So when you get invited for your uh, to apply for your next job, you, you that you're having to go in and and persuade people that do love that talk of a philosophy and they do want to appease the fans, how how do you go about persuading them just to hand over the keys for you to then come in and adapt to what you've got? Well, you, I mean, because of years of service in in the Premier League for myself, I'd like to think that if you if you're already got to a point of um, being an interview process, they must have thought, no, I think he was doing what he had to do because of the groups he worked with, maybe the the financial constraints, you know. So he's made he's moulded yep. a situation to the best of what they could do never been in a situation to bring. Because don't forget, if you are going to change, right? I'll go back to that word. If you're going to change your philosophy, unlikely you can change it one signing, you know. You, you could change your philosophy. You need like two thirds of a team to yeah. change your whole philosophy. As regards, if we went to, to, to make it really simple, if you go long ball or passing, right? You're not going to do that with one player. Highly unlikely. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So therefore, if you've got to change a whole situation to change that, then therefore, back to your point, if I'm sitting in that interview, I'd like to think they're going, right, okay, did he ever have a chance to do that? No. Did he mould something the best he could? Yeah. Was there times when it probably looked better than we thought? Yeah. Got to Europe, you can't do that by just kicking the ball down the pitch. It's impossible, by the way. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Yeah. So you'd like to think they've done their own, weren't they? go, yeah, actually, with our group, would he probably look at things differently? Now, I'd like to think they do that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't know. I think we... I'm not sure we do it. If I'm being totally honest, I think we love to put people in boxes, right? So we would go, um, what job is there available at the moment? Oh, that's a Sean Dice job or yeah. that's a Jose Mourinho job. You know, like, I think if... I'll be all right, it's a good company. I'm, I'm going to accept that. <laughs> exactly. Jose, it's a good company. I'll accept that. I'll but, what he's done. But do you understand what I mean by that? You yeah. know, you would go in and manage Manchester City in a completely different way to how you manage Burnley. Yeah, but, but you're not going to... You can spend so much time and energy on trying to... Uh, kick, kick the walls out of that box what's the point people put you in that's, the, that's life mm. you know what I mean so I gave up that coach years ago oh, I didn't really bother that much if you look down my history I've never really bothered that much people say oh you play this oh, I've gone yeah. yeah okay did it bother you at the beginning I think it only bothers you when other managers get involved I think when the media get involved that's their job their job mm. is to put you in box or, or to use simple terminologies and sell whatever they're selling but I think when other managers come out and say it sometimes you're like really do you know what I mean? You know what we're working yeah, yeah. with and I know what you're working with. And that's when you do go, come on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's a bit, just be, just be, I suppose, a bit more fair up with your views or a bit more respectful with your views. And I think that sometimes irks you a little bit. It doesn't so much as you longer in the tooth, but when yeah. you're in the early days, 
you know, you're almost like, really? Like, you know, we're not, we're not apples and not apples in this game. You know what I mean? When your team's put 500 million and ours is worth 50. <laughs> that's not, they're yeah, not yeah, the same yeah. apples, you know what I mean? So I'd like to think there's a bit more respect sometimes, but that's the way it goes. But it reminds us, sorry, Sean, I was speaking of it oh. then. Um, reminds us of when we interviewed Saul Campbell and he he was giving us stats around um, the like the description of black players as opposed to white players that, that there's been a Danish study he was quoting about how the amount of times a black player will be, pra- will be praised for physicality and a white player compared to their intelligence. And he was saying that when you then graduate into the ranks of management, that people have got this perception that you're not necessarily as intelligent as a white counterpart going in. So stereotyping is there, whether we like it or not, was his point he was making. And it was about trying to overcome those stereotypes. Well, I think, you know, I mean, that's a different field when you're going into race and, and, yeah. and that view. But I get you, I think you're linking into the fact you you are going to be put into a situation where people go, oh, we presuppose that you are that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely get that. Um, but not by all. You know, you've got to remember there's there's a lot of people out there who see through all that. And it, I think that, so I'm not going to cry in. There's people who have gone, you know, no, no, they do. I mean, I'll tell you one, excuse me, I don't know him that well. It was, it was very amusing uh, meeting him. It was a pandemic and obviously, you know, on the side of the pitch, you could spend more time with the manager, weirdly, because obviously there's no one there. Yeah. And you weren't allowed inside, do you remember? Mm. So I saw Carlo Ancelotti. For one, we played him, he'd come out and said, I keep reading all this about um, Sean Knight's four for two long ball. He said, has anyone ever thought I played four for two for most of, like, like two thirds of my career? So he was like, they do brilliant. How they do it, how they work, how they, very complimentary. So I saw him before the game, and you don't always do this, but I said, Carlo, thanks for your words, because they help, you know, someone as legendary as you, what you've done and all that. And he did make me laugh. He said, uh, I said, you know how you find it? He said, well, he said, Sean, he said, um, they tell me I should do this, they tell me I should do that, they tell me I should choose him, they tell me I should choose him. I said, I'll get my 35 years experience and put it in the toilet. <laughs> I just burst out laughing, and he was like, look at me, just going, and he's right, you know, it's, it's the modern game, everyone's got an opinion, everyone's to tell you something. And sometimes you just have to rationalise it down and go, well, is it really going to affect what I do if someone says you're long ball or short ball? Not really, because I know what I'm doing inside. I know the way we're working with the players. I know what we want from the players. Yep. I know the development of my players. I don't, I don't even need to tell you that. You've seen all the stats. We buy players for 2 million and sell them for 20. You know, there's, it's a simple development tool. It's not rocket science, <laughs> you know what I mean? So you go, well, do you really worry that much about someone putting you in whatever situation? You go, well... Sometimes it hurts you a little bit. Mostly you go, yeah, that's the way it is. You know what I mean? But so people in football, you expect, I'd hope, would see through that. A see bit through more, it. Which a lot do. You know, a lot do. So can I ask you another question that be, that's related to that Arrigo Saki book that we're talking about? Because I think there's another I'm, moment. I haven't read the book, by the way, but have you seen the famous um, Arrigo Saki 442 when it shows you his drills and everything? Yes. No. So I've seen that. It's really old now, but right. I've got a version of it. It's a bit grainy. I got it put onto a, a DVD from the old days of video art. Oh, brilliant. So simple, but but they just brilliant. move it. Yeah, they do. They did. They, they, like, well, it's didn't a, even play with an opposition. Did they? Just... I got tired about it. just for you. Go so on. I don't want you to lose your own, But this no, is another great. brilliant one. Um, can't remember. It might have been Robbie Di Matteo. He might have played under him. I think it was him who told me his story. We were on the pro lines or something, and he said um, his famous one. He used to point forward like that, you know, to the team, saying "Get forward," and he'd be shouting "Get back." Get back as he's pointing forward, you know, because he's so defence minded. I love things like that, you know what I mean? He's yeah, like, to the yeah, fans, he's yeah, going, yeah, you know, yeah. on yeah. forward, he's out shouting words, get, get, get back, get back. Get back perception know. over reality. Yeah, absolutely, perception yeah. over reality, exactly. But it was, so sorry, to go back to it, he, he talks about the relationship he had with the chairman there, which was Berlusconi. And there was one occasion where Berlusconi was trying to foist on him a certain player. And I think it might have been somebody rather than Ancelotti who he was desperate to get. Right. And he was prepared to say to him, if you sign him, my resignation comes in the next day because I can't work with the tools that you're going to give me. Mm. And so you'll still have the same high expectations, but you're not going to give me the resources to deliver it. And the relationship was such that Berlusconi decided to step back from getting involved. The reason I was asking that is, would you ever be tempted like if that Burnley situation came up again, where new owners came in, where you can see, I'll resign now rather than try and work in a new different model. Well, I think firstly you earn the right to be powerful enough to say, look, if you sign them, I'm done. Let's you know, let's face it. You know what I mean? You, you know, certain managers have built such a re- 
reputation and so powerful, they probably can say, look, if you sign them, I'm off. You know what I mean? I think that takes time to build that re reputation. I certainly had it to a degree at Burnley. It didn't, it didn't get to that stage, but with the old board, they trusted me enough, whereas if I went, whoa, 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 we can't sign them, they're not going to fit in here. Yep. There wouldn't be that need to go, I'm off if you sign them, because they'd go, okay, we get it. There was always one or two. I went, I'm not sure about that, big risk and stuff like that. Um, I don't, I think you've got to remember that there's a time when you go, right, what would I be doing that for? Am I doing it for my own ego? Is it my, is it not sort of my job to work with the players we've got and try and mould them into what we, because you can still say, I don't think they're going to fit. I'm going to try and work with them the best I can, but I think it's going to be a, a tough challenge. You know what I mean? And so I, I don't know about that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really defining the answer for you, but I'm not sure on that one. I, I've never been put in that position. I think the idea of resignation and all that, it becomes quite a, an individual thing. And I think I was always a team-minded player. I was a team-minded manager. You know, part of me going, well, I'm, I'm going to leave them in the lurch. You know what I mean? All these people have worked tremendously hard. For me, I'm going to leave them in the lurch a little bit. So I don't know. I don't but know. would you not argue that for, because you need to be a certain level of selfish to be able to say, but I'm viewing my career over a 20-year period rather than, a two-year period that if this goes wrong and I think that I'm not going to get the investment or the support, that might damage a reputation that I would struggle to get my next job. Well, my, my thought, which I always explain to the boards I've worked with, was as long as you tell me the truth of the guidelines parameters that I've got to manage, I'll manage it. Right. I didn't like it when they tell you this and then not deliver or, you know, sort of basically tell you myths. Yeah. You know, just tell me the truth. Just tell me the truth of what you want me to manage. So... I think if you've got that as a level to work from, it's when, it's when you know, it hasn't really happened to me too badly, to be fair, but I know managers have been told, yeah, we're going to do all this. And then they get into the job and they go, oh no, we're not doing any of that. And you go, like, now they're in a position where they're like, what, how do you expect me to do what you said you wanted me to do when we agreed this and you're giving me that? Yep. Usually, of course, finance, not always, but used either finance or players. So I think that's a different ballgame. I haven't really experienced that. Right. So, you know, it hasn't really come my way. But I think that's a different ballgame. That's when, you know, some, some as we know, some managers you've seen go into a situation and come out pretty quick. And they have resigned. They've gone, not for me, that. Yeah. But yeah, again, usually, if you know, it's managers who have done a bit, they're, you know, got a bit more reputation, a bit more solid in their careers. When you're a young manager, it's not so, I mean, I'm not so much a young manager now, but I have been in the past. It's not so easy then. Because you're thinking, do I really want to walk away from this? I mean, am I going to walk away mm. from this situation? Premier League manager. You know, I was a Premier League manager, say, at year five. I'm at Burnley. We're not getting the investment, but I'm going, am I really going to walk away? Young English Premier League manager. Yeah, yeah. Where's your next one? So I was like, hang on a minute. Stay and earn your spurs. Keep keep fighting, keep working, keep earning your spurs until a, a point when people have to accept that you sort of know what you're doing. Because <laughs> they go, but well, you can't keep managing the Premier League if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, Trust yeah. me, you can't do it. You can't do it. Was there a, a moment where you... You predicted the way this was going to end. I think I think the the change of the change of ownership and when the dynamic of a the structural side of what we'd put in place starts changing, and then you go, do, you know, that's when you go, all right. Do you realise where you're taking this? Do you as the challenges of explain what you mean to, by the well, so so we'd we'd formed a way of working at Burnley Football. Forget, by the way, this is nothing to do with styles now, right? Mm. We've formed a way of operating, scouting, science, analytics. Blah, blah, blah. Of course, we're all open to newness and, and modern thinking and do you keep your eye on trends, but the department should be doing that anyway. And I believe they were. They're keeping an eye on, you know, whether it's analysis or, you know, we were looking at laser GPS instead of the normal GPS and all sorts of different things behind the scenes that we thought might add the inches. So you, you want to be doing that. You're looking down the road of, you know, how many times can you change it? But there's a base that was in place. And then when that starts changing, you start going, hang on a minute. If you're going to start changing that, we need to add that into the people that are here. You know, we can't just do one with the same people because the same people need changing as well. Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? So, you know, if you bring in six or seven players here and a new structure here, guess what? They only know the new structure. But the ones who have been under this structure and then they have to move that, whoa, what's going on here? So then you get an odd reaction and it starts changing the view and then, you know, yourself, some of your top heads of department are going, am I, who am I answering to? I, I think I was answering to you, but I'm answering to you now. Yeah. And they're only small things, but they start chipping away. And then your staff start coming in, who, who, which one am I answering to? Yeah. So, so did you have that? It was growing. Yeah. 
Not in a vicious way, though. Yeah. In, a, in an explanatory way, you know, the new ownership went, oh, we want to try and bring this in and bring that in and bring yeah. that. And I'm like, all right, but it's a slow burner. It needs to be one step at a time. Not many in my experience, um, well, not actually, well, yeah, kind of in my experience, but also in my knowledge of owners and um, directors of football, when they get put in place, guess what they want to do? They want to change it, don't they? Because yeah. they, they want to put their mark on it. You know what I mean? It's very rare. They just literally go, right, crack on. So some I had to be flexible with, and I was flexible with, to go, all right, We'll, we'll see if we can mould that and adjust it. Recruitment and stuff like that. The positive side of that was a more open-mindedness about European players and stuff. Obviously, we brought in Val Vegorst and Maxwell Cornet, which I've been sort of pushing the old ball. Look, we need to start opening up. We need to start taking more risks with our player signing um, along the lines of giving us a different view and how we play and all that sort of stuff. So that was a refreshing side of it. Then the, the the other side of it, the challenge was when you go, why are you sort of mixing and matching these ideas? Why are you you know trying to sort of twist and tweak things that don't really need, well they need it maybe over time, but not like that, you know. And that was going to be the biggest challenge. So trying to blend that new thinking into the structure that was there, buy in from everyone, that's difficult. That's the most difficult thing. So and what advice would you give to like? New owners, so people listening to this might be going into a new business or they might be like teachers going into a new classroom. But in relation to your experience with football, what advice would you give an owner if they buy a football club like Burnley? What sort of the first three steps you'd, you'd advocate? Yeah, this every do? bit of advice, but what I would say is that I think you've, it depends on what club you're buying into, quite obviously, and um, what's there. Yeah, again, the biggest thing for me, right, I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and like I say, I'm not going to start preaching. Just take a breath. Just right. look at what's going on and don't think you're going to see it all in one day because you're not. Take a breath, see it working. You know, it's old big brother cameras, right? You know, they say the psychologists say it's like three weeks and then you start switching off or whatever it is, you know, a week and yeah. your brain starts switching off. So if you go in, right, and you're an owner and you're in there every day, guess what we're going to do for three weeks? It's all like, hi, hi, owner, you know, we're all working like crazy. Yeah. Then three, we'll call it three weeks, but starts changing. Then you go, right, now is a true view of what's going on. That's what I'd say. If, if you're a hands-on owner, don't forget. If you're a hands-off owner and you're delegating to everyone, that's a different ball game. Yeah. But even the next in command, so let's call it director of football. Just take a breath and absorb it. That's what I think is important. But yeah. it's not. I'm not preaching, but that's what I'd do. I'd say to the director of football, right, call your jets, take your time, just let people revert back to being normal, not this newness, you know what yeah. I mean? And just give it a window to then go, right, now we've had a look at it. I've spoke to all the staff. I've gathered the information. Now where are we going to take it? So the new owners come in and the director of football comes in and changes start to happen, right? You can look at that and go, well, the owners made changes and they weren't the right ones. But that doesn't inform you for your next job. I'm interested in, you know, I think you're great at self-reflection. You're a bright guy. You go to loads of different sports and learn from them. Do you, could you have done more, do you think, to either embrace the change or work with the change? Or do you feel you'd cave absolutely everything and it just... I actually thought it was interesting for me, right? So I actually thought, right, okay, so now imagine, take yourself out of this and now you, you're in your helicopter and you're flying to a new job and this structure is in place. So I was actually thinking, right, okay, so... So what you, that's how you worked it in your Yeah, head. I was thinking, right, okay, yeah. don't, don't resist everything, mm -hmm. learn with it because... What happens if the next club, somewhere down the line, are like that? Yeah. So now I was actually saying to the staff, whoa, whoa, whoa. Staff are getting a bit fidgety. They're going, oh, you know, I've been asked to do this. I'm, asked to do I'm going, yeah, because that's newness. That's what happens. You know, so if we all go down to the next club, they might be going, right, what are you doing this? What are you doing that? What are you doing that? So that that's part mm -hmm. of development. Well, I can't preach development then not develop myself, can I? So I had to sit there and go, right, okay. Speak to the owner, speak to the owner. Right, what do you want from us? What do you want to share? What are you hoping to do? How can we do this? How? Speak to the staff. The analysts go, no, they've asked me to do this. I was going, yeah, that's your job. They're asking you to do your job. They're just asking you to do it in a different way. So do it. Yeah. You know, and then feed it back. That's, yeah. you know. So no, I was, I was all right with that, actually. I was like, right, okay. But not losing sight of the basic principle of, why are you doing that? You still got to win games. And we weren't winning games. And I knew what was wrong with that. And what was that? Well, we hadn't, we hadn't invested. The, the team were losing that 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 edge. Yeah. There's an edge on a team. Let, let's you know talk about I mean? this then. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I love this idea of renewal because I think it applies to any walk of life, any business. It even, it even applies to parenting. You can't just keep doing the same thing year after year and expecting your kids to respond. So did you sense 
a lack of, not even bringing in more quality, but just bringing in a different group. It was a slow burn. It was, it was before that, you know, so it's nothing to do just to be clear. There's nothing to do with the ownership change. It was yeah. before it was, it was, it was everyone involved, not just the new, because the new owners would argue we didn't want to put a load of money in because we were trying to buy the club. The olders are arguing we didn't want to put a load of money in because we're trying to sell the club. So there's no fault here. It's just a, a natural thing Absolutely. that happened is yeah. when, when the investment was needed, it wasn't there. Yeah. We know the players are getting older, you know, and some are losing that just as an edge. It's hard to describe football. People generally know it when the players are just, not all, you know. And how does that manifest itself yeah. to you? How do you see that? I think it's, well, I've been in the game since I was 16. Yeah. You, you can almost smell it on a person, you know what I mean? When they're just too many excuses start creeping in, right. and they do for this sort of, um, I know what I need mentality. You know, I shouldn't be doing that. I know what I need. And you go, oh, there's the first warning signs. Yeah. You know, players always start when they get to the end period and they just start softening a bit. So, oh, I know what I need now. And you go, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. You know, you're forgetting what you really need and replacing it what you think you really need. You know, so yeah. there's a difference there. Yeah. Then you got the, the mentality of a group who have been listening to us a long time. Our rhetoric suddenly becomes, is it the same? You know, can, what are you changing? If you're not changing the people, by the way, what are you changing? How are you changing things? And all these things just start adding little tiny bits. And without refreshing as in people, how do you change that? So, yeah, again, we, we you know, you can only do new managed thinking so many times. Yeah. Because they're the same people. So, therefore, you're going, right, okay, we need to change the actual people. Usually yeah. the players, all the staff, of course. That's why they change managers and they change coaches. We need to change some of the people. And we just never had the finance in place at the right time to start doing that because it could have been done a couple of years before. Mm. Then back to your point. So we're not just talking about, like at Burnley, with all due respect, you're unlikely to get like true, amazing quality that is just like, wow, Premier League ready every minute, you know, they come in. But just the fact there's new people in, it just stimulates. Yeah. We were saying before, I was... We we're talking about it, and I said it, it's like you know the kids in the play in the in the classroom. A new kid comes in, they're all on the best behavior, yeah, 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 yeah. and it just stimulates a change. Yeah. And then after three or four weeks, the, the kid becomes a normal kid, and they go, oh. <laughs> you know, that's it. But it stimulates a change. So you sometimes it's not about bringing in world beers; it's about bringing in a newness where everyone sort of rubs off on each other slightly differently. Maxwell Corne did it for a bit. Mm. Val Vegors did it for a bit, but you got Woody going out, one coming in. So, you know, someone going, all oh, right, I'm not sure about that. Stephen DeFore definitely did it earlier on, you know, when it, before he had a bad injury, but the way he was. Some just naturally stimulate just because they're there, just because they're physically in the building, new faces, new change, different ways of operating, just naturally gives a bit of a stimulus. And you'd spoken previously about when you had a bad run once where – the leadership group amongst that dressing room had asked you to step out of the room and they took hold of the reins for a while to to reinvigorate it once you were um, in a bad run and it was a post-Christmas period that things turned around. What about your leadership group in this time? Didn't really do, I didn't really do a leadership group. I think that was just the older players who right. sort of went, took took ownership, if you like. Yeah. Just said, Gaffer, we, we need to have a word amongst them. Because they'd realised, basically, the penny drops. You know, when you've, you your voice is only so powerful. In the end, a few of them went, hang on, lads. This mm. ain't right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because we had an open environment with the trust in each other type thing, I went, cool, you you crack on, lads. But they weren't really a leadership group. Right. I was always a, I was always a bit wary about that. I mean... Because? Well, because if you two are in the leadership group, and no, I'm not, what am I thinking? I'm going, oh, I should be in there. So who do you define yeah. as being the leadership group. So yep. I've always been a little bit... Mm, it's a bit like means leadership. testing your players and there's always someone on the cusp. Yeah, that feels yeah a little hard bit. And, and you get the wrong one on the cusp. He goes, well, I disagree. Yeah. And then suddenly you get this sort of friction. So I've been more into just people who are naturally want to come and talk or they, you know... Right. You do, I mean, the obvious ones, right? So not a group. But you'd have your captain, right? Usually your captain's there for a reason. He's there because he's got a quite a solid, tight, maybe a very good performer or whatever. But usually for a reason. And probably pretty consistent. Probably your next captain, if you like, assistant captain, whichever you want to call it, you know, probably similar. So you might now and again pick their brain. Sometimes, you know, horse whispering, as I call it, you don't have to have a big meeting with them. You just walk up to them and just go, well, you know, what's your thoughts? You know, anything? Everything all right? Don't have to be. My biggest rule, actually, within that, there's always a rule within a rule, but was to not be sneaky. I'd never asked them to sneak about. Right. Ever. I always said to the guy, you'll not be getting me saying, hey, you know what, so-and-so thinking. I said, mm -hmm. that ain't going to happen. But if it's something serious, you need to come and tell me. Yeah. And if you think it's trouble, 
you need to come and tell me. Or someone's got something wrong in their life they need help with, you need to tell me. But I didn't like that. I didn't like sneaking about. It wasn't for me, that. But was that ever a, a possibility that you would lean on your more senior players or your more reliable players to harness the dressing room to reinvigorate it sometimes like i say you just have a casual chat it wouldn't be a big meeting you know what Boney or T tony or steve stone they'd just pop you know oh, what, what's your thoughts and they go oh, i was chatting to so and so that's the difference between you know there's a fine line there but it's a difference that between sneaking about and almost like hey you know that's yeah, not yeah. a word and just having a conversation sometimes it'd be an open conversation so we'd all be sitting there and i might ask you but you're listening so you're more than welcome to join in do you right. know what I mean, you know, I'm just having a coffee. Just pop, hey, what was your thoughts? You know, did you see so and so the weekend? What was your thoughts of that? But that might be linking in to something that's happened in your group, yeah. your NLP, and the fact that that happened in another group. You go, what do you think of that? And they give you an opinion. Then you go, oh, didn't you tell me that you thought that though? Yeah. Oh, all oh, right. Yeah. All right. Well, it was all right for them, but not for you then. You know what I mean? And then you go like, oh. you see him going, oh, okay. Yeah. So you know, there's different ways to get information, but. Like I say, I preferred to talk it out. I didn't really like the, you know, some environments of managing enough you know, certain people. They're almost like, hey, hey, come and tell us what's going on. That yeah. wasn't for me. Right. Not really my bag. So you're in this, having been at Burnley and done such a good job for so long, you're suddenly in this slightly alien environment where you feel the lack of renewal along the squad. You feel a few changes from the new owners and it, it all comes together. What about you personally? Like the only real value for this is for you to reflect on what you could have done better as a leader what what is different about the Sean Dyche that walks back into a, a football dressing room in the next few months from what you went through in this period I think the you you reinvigorate just naturally so I came out I wasn't I didn't think I was the energized I wasn't uh, didn't feel overwhelmed with pressure um I came out okay that's the way it is and over time you immediately or my my immediate feeling was okay Park that, didn't get involved, wasn't watching every Burnley game and all that. I wished them well. I didn't want them to go down. I said, no, no. You know, it gets popular belief, by the way, because I'm yeah. like, hang on, we put nine, nine and a half years effort into that. So why would I want it to go down? How did now? it feel the day they went right down? They got Just like a bit sort of in the 30% of your ego kicks in. You go, well, shouldn't have changed it. But 70% of me go, well, hang on, I grafted me rear off for nine and a half years amongst yeah. many others. So why do you want it to fail now? Yeah. I don't want it to fail. Why would you want that? I just, I'd prefer someone to get hold of what we did and then take it in further. And then you go, right, because they'll remember that. They'll go, well, without them, it mm. wouldn't have even been there. Do you think you'd have kept them up? Yeah. Just because, though, not because I've got magic dust, just because we'd had a tough period, but we were coming into eight games that on paper were, the, were the, the, one of the best periods of the season. And we'd sort of bottomed out a bit. Sometimes you can you can tell it when you sort of hit a bottom and you're ready, to, you know, it's almost like, lads, come on. You know what I mean? We're better than that type of thing. Um, so I thought we would have, but it's easy for me to say that as if, as if I'm honestly going to sit here and go, nah, <laughs> come on, let's have it right. I won't say yes, but I do believe it just because more on the paper, you know, I know the, I know the schedules in the Premier League, yeah. seven out of the eight games, you thought more so, like. So did you try and fight it then when they, I mean, I don't even know how it works when a manager loses a job. Well, I don't mind telling you because it was so simple. Uh, Alan Pace um, said, can I come in and see you early? Alarm bell starts going, obviously, no yeah. problem, unusual. I popped in the gym like I normally did. He comes up. Did you think that was it then? Hey, everything all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to make a change. Okay. You know, for what reason? Well, you know, just feel as it was two days before a game. What did they say Strange. was the reason at that point? Said, well, you know, we just feel it's right to. I've been sitting on it. I said, okay. I said, just be respectful of people's situations, contracts and all that. That's the way it goes. And I said, do you mind me talking to the staff? He said, no. Do you mind me having a quick meeting with the players? He said, no. I said, okay, I wish you well. I'm not really, I'm not really one for, yeah. you know, crying too much. Just There's not on. a part of you then that goes, listen, there couldn't be a worse time to do this. I feel we've bottomed out. I feel we're going to turn a corner in the next couple of days. I feel the next, next eight games are really winnable. Well, what, what would you, uh, it's a fair, it's a fair shout, but what would be looking to, what's that, a stay of execution then? Just buy one more game or something, you know? Because I think like, if you if then you, keep if them up. If they've made then, that decision. Yeah. I was going, well, you've obviously either made a decision, you've taken advice, or you've made a joint decision or whatever. So that decision's unlikely to, well, I yeah. think it would be even more bizarre. Because I've got to be honest, right, here's what I'm feeling. Let me turn that on its head. So imagine me going, well, I can't believe you're doing this. You must be mad, da, 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 da. And he went, right, we're going to keep you. And I went, I don't think so, I'm off. Cheers. Sort <laughs> yeah. the contract out. See you later. Yeah, but in any relationship. Yeah, I know bizarre, what you mean. Yeah, bizarre. but I'd argue that. There's not a lot of faith, is there? If I talk to you around, I'd be going, 
I got him out of a coast. Just suck me another, re-employ me within 30 seconds yeah. of me saying you must be mad. But, but if you compare it to a relationship, like you'd like to think that if you were like with your partner, if you ever thinking of leaving, there'd have been warning shots before that. There'd have been conversations of this isn't working. Yeah, but Is the there any way that we people, can do it? People, you notice people start ducking the cover by it. People start disappearing. Oh, don't get me wrong. When you're winning, right, and you're a manager, people around you like, honestly, like bees on yeah. any part. When yeah. you're listening, you suddenly go, where's everyone gone? You know, but, the people start disappearing. So, yeah, I noticed the change and players acting a bit, you know, coaches, not so much your immediate coaches, yeah, but yeah. the peripheral groups all, you know, a bit like, oh, morning. Oh, yeah, you notice all the subtle cues. But at the end of the day, we all know what fixes that, and that's winning games. Yeah. Sure, but I'm still thinking from an, an owner's perspective, not necessarily from yours, that maybe to go and have that conversation a month early and say, Sean, we're worried there, this isn't working, and you know you're on the edge like you're on the edge that you can have that conversation that jake's suggesting yeah, which way which way you open to get reactions so some some managers coaches could really suffer with that some might go right but at the end of the day you're still going right for other people you still got to stimulate other people yeah you might still be i was perfectly stimulated i'm looking around my group going right who's going to come with me you know who's going to who's who's going to pick up the mantle at the minute who is going to you know thrive off this there's a few I mean, I'll give you an example. I thought it was terrific. James Tarkowski, he, he was out of contract. Trust me, he was on it. He was right on it. You know, he was going, right, lads, hey, come on. And I thought, fair play to you. You know, you're mm. playing hard. You're playing, doing what you can. You know, good or bad, but the fact is you're on it. And I thought, fair play. I don't think that's easy when you're out of contract. He's missed a couple of moves, by the way. A couple of people have been in for him over the last couple of years. Didn't quite come around his way. I thought, fair play to you, fantastic professional you've turned into. Because he was just, bang, let's have it. You know, yeah. I'm right on top of it. And did and you there see... There wasn't all like that. And then, you know, Yeah, well, I was going to say, did you notice a, a large proportion, really, big impact? No, but no not, not really. It's just, it's, it's like I say, nothing vicious, nothing yeah. like that. It's just that edge. It's just a drop. It's hard to explain. You don't have to, yeah. you know, we're not talking about massive margins. We're not talking about, you know, sneaking about and all that. You're just talking about dropping everything. You, do, you know, we're going to Norwich and they look f full of fear, you know. And we were, we were a team that never really had that fearful look. You know, we'd, even when we got clubbed off Man City, we didn't really look fearful. We just got beat. They were just too strong or too good. But, you know, against Norwich, I'm going to think, oh, that's, that's not right. You know what I mean? That just doesn't look... That's a, that's a group with fear in them. You know, people who you know can do way better, deal with the ball, do whatever they have to do in a game, and you think, oh, you know, miles, miles away What did you say to them after that? Other one? than three or four who, uh, who were on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? What did you say to them after that? Well, oh, okay. okay, so here's, here's, a, here's one for you. So do you tell them the truth, truth, knowing that you've got a game again the next week, or do you tell them a version of the truth... Or to tell them a load of, it'll be all right, lads. So I, I find a mixture of not to be all right, lads. I don't do that one because no. it, it's not, you know, what are you going to do? Hurrah, we, you know, we're going to win everything. I never BS players. So I go, version of the truth for some who can handle a version, but they can't handle the truth, truth. And then a few, you go, by the way, that's miles off. So, but that was consistency. That's different. So I was consistent through all my time at Burnley, I think. People might tell you different, but I think I was. So I would work like that, finish seventh or finish one place above the bottom, by the bottom of three or whatever. I would be consistent. So they would be expecting me to handle myself how I do handle myself. But after that game, you really, you did not, you know, I was going, right, that ain't good enough. Yeah. That is way, way from what our norms are. Yeah. Both for them, the collective, the feel, all of that. So that week, I'm thinking, mm, this is not right. And then you're trying to re-stimulate, you analyze it, you look through it, trying to, you know, get the, get the fear out of them. Because you, your job is to take the yeah. fear out away. Your job is to handle that, not theirs. What's you want the, them to what's the role of, uh, of self-doubt in this situation? Because you've done really, such I'm a lot really with them. too badly no? with that, you know. No, because I just sort think... Of thinking, why I can always find the answer at Burnley. Why can I not find the answer? Well, sometimes you're looking where you need other people to help you find the answer, yeah. and usually the players. You know, you, sometimes you come on then. You've, you've asked a lot of me. I think I've delivered a lot over our time together, whether that be personal for you as an individual and your contracts and all that. Come on then, it's payback time. Yep. Sometimes I pay you back, sometimes I don't. You know what I mean? But there's no blame with that. They're human beings. You know, we'd stimulate. We'd got miracles out of some of these players. You know what I mean? I think. And, and drops out, rinsing drops and drops and drops. And them themselves, by the way. You know, once you're putting them in the right direction, they run with it. 
So there has to be reality sometimes, but I'm nearly, I don't really suffer too badly with self-doubt. If, if I think the work's getting done, I think the work is getting shortcutted or, we're, or I'm shortcutting or the staff, that's different. Yeah. And I go, whoa, whoa, hang on, we've got to look at ourselves. I don't think we were lacking the work. I think we just, this is the defining thing that's very, very difficult to, to explain it. That, that X factor, that inch that takes the difference. And you'll have seen it. You'll have watched certain performances, not just football. You'll all have watched it. I don't know. It might be athletic. And you think, oh, I can't. Yeah. Through a TV screen, it's like your brain does that thing where you go, oh, I can feel it. And equally when they're on it, you go, yep. oh, they're, they're flying. They're going to win this. They're going to do it. The whole feel of a performance, you know what I mean? Yep. So we all do it, by the way. It's just that when you're in football and you're doing it, as long as me, you can, you, you can smell it and mm. see it and feel it quicker. That's all it is. And you know when it's not right. But putting it right, which we had done, not just me, staff, making it right over nine and a half years. And then you come to the, the last drops and you're going, what drops are left? before you need them to go, yeah. right, come on, lads. Do you know what I mean? So tell us about the difference between these players in the dressing room where some of it you've got to couch the feedback and some of it where you can just be honest with them. What's the difference between those? Well, there was and never, how there was never lack of honesty. I just, it's soft on a hard on Sure, honesty. yeah, the you difference. Know, I, I, never, I, I never went in for spinning things, not really my bag. I'd just go, this is how I see it. Right. But so tell us the distinction between soft and hard honesty. Then. Well, so so when you profile people or when you get a feel from just a gut feel, and you I always speak to my staff, go, right, what do you think? You know, hard, medium, soft. You know, what, what do you think's needed? Because they're right. still getting the truth, end of. They go, don't know, they're a bit up and down. I've heard that they're, you know, I don't know, they're, they're having a funny time with their misses. You go, right, okay, might have to play around with that a little bit. Right. Others, you go, now nah, they're in good shape. Uh, that, not good enough from them. They just get, hey, come on, hard truth. You know, finding out the background. I mean, my way of working would always be if I thought someone was really off, right, to give you a, a simpler view. First of all, I'd always say, is everything okay? Forget football, is everything okay? Because sometimes you get that really wrong, you know. I mean, you're going to give it to someone. Yep. And they go, look, I'm on a really bad time mm. with whatever. And then you go, Phew. so I always think, right, check that everything's okay first. And then go, right, okay, then we need to talk what's going on sort of thing and then I always listen go right okay you tell me what you think so you'd always start Brian with Clough that you'd invite them we'd decide that I was right <laughs> like it always used to say. so is that how you'd always start beyond asking how are you is everything okay you'd then ask them for their opinion first yeah go, I'd go what's your thoughts right you know, tell me what's, what's your thoughts you know you look you, maybe I'd lead in and go look I think you look a bit off what's your thoughts because you can get involved in something and then you haven't, you know, you haven't given them a chance to speak. We never used to, I never used to have that as a player. Right. Sometimes rightly, sometimes should have got direction. And people misconstrue that nowadays. Oh no, you have to listen. I mean, no, you don't. You're the leader. You can sometimes go, wait, this is what's getting done. End of story. Yep. But usually it's still better to at least get some feedback and then say, right, okay, let's cut through <laughs> that. This is what's getting done. Because yeah. at least you've given them a chance to speak. It's, it's been so interesting sort of looking at the end of your time at Burnley in the context of the wider successes that you had there. Now you've had this opportunity to have a bit of a break from the game, not much of one, only a few months. When you go into a job, what's going to be the first reassurance or the first question you're going to ask of a, a potential new chairman, director of a football club to know that it's the right next step for you in your career? I don't think there's a, a perfect answer because you've got different um, boards, you've got different only like sometimes different panels who mm. would interview you. You know, is it the director of football? Is it the owner? Is the owner hands on? Is the owner hands off? Who's who's the runners and riders involved? Once you define them, I'd go for the feel of a club. So usually, let's have it right. You know the feel of a club, maybe location. Like Burnley, I went in there. My strap line was, I'm not going to guarantee it'd be amazing football. What I will guarantee, you'll have a team that puts sweat on the shirt because that part of the country. Tough times and a bit about the history, you know, real downtrodden at times plays, and it, you know, a bit down on its luck. If I was a fan, I thought I'd want to see people wear that shirt and give their lot. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I right, that. okay, that's a start point. For example, different parts of the country, different social aspect, different feel about the club. You'd probably look at that. I'd, well, I'd look at that as well. Look at the playing staff. This is what it requires, in my opinion. So then I'd give an overview of, right, okay, I know a bit about your club, I know a bit about your staff, I've seen the, whatever, say the last five years of growth, let's say. Um, 
where do you think it can go now? They tell you they think it usually can go to the stratosphere. <laughs> you know, right, okay, well, let's maybe cool that down a little bit. You know, what's the reality? And that kind of scenario, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not it's not a it's not a, a one size fits all situation because you've got a lot of different clubs, a lot of different feels about it. you know, right, so an extreme example. So probably changed slightly, but you know, Tottenham. Tottenham are always the you know, the the football in fancy dance of, of London, mm -hmm. let's say. Lads, it's Tottenham. Yeah, Alex yeah. Ferguson's right. famous. And then yeah. about uh, Pochettino did brilliant. I thought he changed that perception massively. And let's have it right, because yeah. he got him yeah. running. Really running. So there's a change of he took the fact we're still going to play, which they did, but he had them playing harder, not necessarily tougher like um, tackling tough, but, you know, running hard, yeah. working hard, but still playing. So there's a shift. You know, he's gone in and said, right, we're still going to be Tottenham and we still are going to be a really good football inside, but we're going to have a much harder edge about us and we're going to be fit as you like. And that's what he did. Yeah. So there's an example. Well, that's an example that I would use as being taking what's there, but adding your you know, instinct and your feel of what it was. And Trips would vouch for that because he was there and he said, said Pochettino's pre-season, he said it absolutely smashes yours, Gavin. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. And so. what about the players then? Because there's that great phrase, you only get one chance to make a good first impression. When you next walk into a dressing room? Well, okay, so let's imagine this. You know, earlier on we were talking about you, you fit in a box or you live in a box, yeah. right? Well, I probably would, wouldn't I? So probably if I walk into whatever dressing room, you know, should someone offer me a job, Probably going to go, all right, he's probably going to be pretty disciplined, probably going to work us pretty hard, probably going to want a lot from us, probably going to be, I would imagine, pretty honest, probably going to be honest with himself and what we're about, and probably going to be a bit of one of us type thing. I might have that wrong, but I would think yeah, that's probably yep. a feel, a generalised yep. feel. What you hope then is within all that, because by the way, they will get all that, but then afterwards, they go, mind you, I think I think I can, you know, I can associate with him. I can appreciate. Him, I can I can see him. I can go and speak with him. And then once they get to know you a bit better, they go, yeah, actually, all right. That's the bit that I think would be a bit more unknown. You know, a bit of weird mm. chat. What do you think like, would take right. them by surprise? Good looks, <laughs> fashion sense. No, I don't, I don't know. I am. Um, you do, but I you're too I just think maybe approachable. I think more approachable. Yeah. Most people who work with me, players and that, go, oh, no way. You know, you, I can approach, I can talk to the gaffer yeah. about. And do you whatever. get ahead of it? Would you go in and go, listen, lads, you think you know what you're getting here? You think you're getting this and this and this and this and you've seen me do this and this. But here's the reality. No, I, th I think um, I think when I went into Burnley, because I was a one season manager, I said, this is what you're going to get from me. Told them. And this is what I'd expect from you. But I think now it's slightly different because they probably, you know, they've got all these opinions, but I'd still be pretty clear and go, look, this is yeah. what I think we can offer you. It was always about the players for me. So it'd be yeah. them. I'd go, this is what we feel or I feel as manager, these staff, let's imagine, you, you know, you take some staff in. This is what we're prepared to give to you. This is what we feel is going to be important for you. Because I always think if you can affect the person, you'll affect their performance. So therefore, it's about them, not about me. And that still links in with the brand thing, you know, from back at the beginning of this conversation. The brand is about them. I do what I do because I think they've got a chance to grow, mature and do well from it. And I'll do well if they do well. So that was always my thought on it. So can I ask you a killer question that any potential employer would ask you? Because seeing you come here today, you look really well. You look like there's a lot of stress that's been come off you. You look in good shape. So why on earth would you want to go back into that world? Yeah, but you know, I think that's a little bit of perception as well. You know, you've got to remember, so taking away jobs and no jobs, I've been on holiday a few times, believe it or not, I do get a little bit of a tan. Um, I, I do generally look after myself. People don't normally see me like this for another thing. They just see me in a suit and a tie and all yeah. that. I always, virtually always get, you're taller than I thought, you're skinnier than what I thought. <laughs> um, they're the two biggest things. Um you know, so some of it is just you, your mind. I don't, I don't think I looked incredibly stressed at the end of last season when I came out. No, but I'm contrasting would, it to when we met you in December 2019. Yeah, what I would say is, okay, are you refreshed? If I was there, I'd be saying, are you though? You mm. might look it, but are you? Are you refreshed? Are you ready to go again? Can you think that you're going to offer more or at least what you've been offering, but are you going to stimulate more from yourself, from your staff, from the players? Of course. Um, that would be their question, I imagine. I don't know. But I'm asking it of you because I think 
like the lessons that you've got and some of the wisdom that you've acquired over the years is surely applicable far wider than just going into a dressing room running. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, uh, going beyond, not beyond football, but around football, I've, I've, I have enjoyed chatting like this because you get a chance to open up a little bit about, you know, take away some of the myths maybe and offer a, an opinion. Um, I've done a few podcasts, quite some small, some social. This is obviously a different thing because we're quite in-depth about it, but some have just been, you know, little things about yourself, about life, about yeah. managing and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Um, the media, I've been offered lots of media. The reason why I haven't done the, sorry, I know this media, the big, you know, the obvious media yeah. is because you put an opinion out there, as we know, it gets smashed about everywhere and you go, hang on a minute, I didn't say that and I didn't say it in that way. So I'm a bit wary of that because I'm still an active, what I consider myself an active manager. If there comes a time when I step beyond that, I'd go out and say, right, this is what I think. But at the minute, don't mm. think anyone needs my opinion greatly. Um, so I haven't done much of that. Football-wise, I've backed down from that to give myself a chance to sort of rejuvenate my thirst. Not that I needed energy-wise, but to go, right, when I'm ready to go back in, I am ready. When we're really ready. And are you ready now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've had a bit of a, you know, I've had a few beers, me mates, and took them away and games of golf and all that sort of stuff. I've not been mad about the football. That was the point, yeah. sorry. You know, I haven't been obsessing about football. People ringing me and saying, oh, did you see this game, see that game? I'm like, no, you know. Stepped away from all that. But then slowly but surely, you imagine you nick a game here and there and you watch a game. I watched a few games, but I've been casual, social, you know, not in suits and all that. Forest and my family relocated to Nottingham. So I've been down to Forest a few times at the end of last season and the beginning of this season. Um, things like that, you know what I mean? But not... And it sounds so it idyllic what back. you're doing now, right? So why go back in? Because it, as you've already said, it is a game full of opinion. It you, is a no, game you're that right. loves you're to right. twist what you say or pl apply the pressure. Well, I, know, I don't think I go back into anything. Yeah. You know, there was a time in my life when you probably just have to get your next job. Mm. Maybe you want to come out of Watford. Yeah. I don't think I have to do that. I certainly don't financially. That's not a clever comment. You can all imagine the Premier League is just one of them leagues. It looks after you and people around you. So there's none of that pressure, which is a nice position to have as regards uh, thinking about jobs. You know, yeah. you're not yeah. under pressure to be pushed into a job. Um, but to be honest, yeah, I've been in it all my life, you know, and it is, it's a thing. Football's a thing. It's not, yeah. you know what I mean? The win, the, 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 I, it wasn't, the love of football is a different thing for me. I love the winning. I love the, the management. I love the organizing. I love the idea of giving more to someone else to allow them to have a career that hopefully is beyond my career as a, as a player. I like that. I like that feedback from that. You know what I mean? I mean, Kieran Trippier, he FaceTimed me when they won La League. He FaceTimed me off the pitch. Wow. I mean, that is When they awesome. won the title? Yeah, and I'm just Blimey. like, trips, what on earth? You know what I mean? What that means reaction? so much to me. I'm just going like, you know, because he knows that I had a reaction with him wow. and him with me where it rubbed off on him. And that means a lot to me. Yeah. Things like that mean as much to me as all sorts of different things happen in my career. So building that rapport, and not just him, ex-players. Yeah, I get messages from ex-players. Gaffer, thanks for, you know, this, thanks for that and all that. That means a lot, I um, think, you know what I mean? And I really like that side of not not just the love of the game so much, but, the you know, people. Doing something good by yeah. people is a good situation. And I really like that. So that's a bit of a drug of mine, you know what I mean? When you really feel like you're connected mm. with someone, you've given them a chance. Not just me, my staff, the, the environment, the culture. You know, it's not always just a me and you thing, but I really like that. I think you've rubbed off on someone and affected mm. them. I think that's a really powerful thing. And I think it's great that you're not sitting here feeling burned or feeling scorned or disillusioned with the game. Because I, I think it, from the outside, I think it's very odd to remove a manager with a decade's worth of experience at a football club with eight games to go, with a, the, the riches of the Premier League on the line and replace them with novices. Right? It feels like no other business in the land does that outside of football. And I think then, then it's easy for you to feel disillusioned with the game. But I get the impression that that's... That's not the emotion at all. No, I've always had a good a good value of things to be reality bound. You know, it's from my parents. I was like, look, you know, be reality bound. Mm. You know, know the situation you're in. As long as you know the situation you're in, and we all know football, I certainly do, it can be a very taxing, very unfair business, but it can be an amazing business as well. So I know what it's like. My story is minimal compared to some stories I've heard. You know, but, but managers getting mad stuff happen to them. You know what I mean? And mine's pretty low compared to that. So I go, right, okay, what's the reality of the job I'm in? Can it go pear-shaped? Can you lose games? I'd been saying for years at Burnley, not a negative. I said, my day will come just because that's the way football works. Mm. You know, one day people just get bored with your rhetoric and they go, right, we want change. You know, they get changed and they go, you know, <laughs> that's the way it goes. 
So how do you define all these things? But no, I'm certainly not. You're right. I'm not. Um, there's no anger or anything. There wasn't at first either. There wasn't. Yeah. I genuinely mean it. I just went, okay, that's the way it goes. It doesn't mean I was happy about it either, by the way. Let's make that clear. But you spend a long time being, you know, thinking you've been hard done by in your life and it drains, it drains the life out of you all that. It saps the life out of you. If you get too much into that world of woe is me, yeah. it saps the life out of you. That de energize you for your life, let alone your, your profession. So that technique you said there about talking about knowing that the end will come one day how, for whatever the reason is, is that a technique that you would ever use, at, say, at the start of a season to say, what could get us relegated here? And you almost face the worst case scenario and then plan backwards from there of how... Like um, more more the case, the opposite of that, actually. We more look at the successful side and go, right, how can we plan backwards from the outcome? Right. So what would be... Um, not always with the players, you understand, because I've always, so another thing I've always been a little bit wary of, it's not whether I believe it or not, is you know this idea of you should set goals. What about when you don't achieve them goals? How does that feel then? Yeah. It's always yeah. been, why, why can't we be open-minded? Why can we not be open-minded to challenge ourselves for what comes next? So I never really did the thing with the players, we need to finish there. Um, but equally, how many how many layers can you put in place f- to allow them to finish where they want to be? Yeah. So that process, I'd work, in answer to your question, the outcome backwards would be, right, I think we should be achieving that. How are we going to get them to get to a point of achieving that? Like that? Do you get what I mean? Mm. So not really the negative version of it, but the positive version of it. Because the reason I ask is I often, like, <laughs> like when you hear manager, you know when they say, oh, the Christmas fixture list is crazy, and you go, didn't you know that yeah, at the start of the really season? Bought, I know, I've never really bought into that. You must have seen my comments. I just go, mm, yeah, two games, ooh, two games, professional athletes, but like two games in three days. I'm going, really? Well, they can't yeah. handle two games in three days when they're professional athletes. I'm like, come on, they'll be all right. You know yeah. what I mean? With with amazing recovery now and diet and support. Helpful if you've got five subs and the big squads and all that, of course. But the point is, come on. Yeah. Come on, lads. Let's crack on, eh? You know what I mean? Absolutely. There comes a time, you know. And can I ask you one question? Like you've mentioned Kieran Tripp here a few times, so it's obvious you have like I don't a like depth to mention of favourites apart from Kieran. <laughs> well, that's why I always tell the players. <laughs> well. I tell them, I go, you know, I don't do favourites, lads, apart from Kieran. Nice. What was it about him and your relationship that, that just? I think he was. He, we got him as a little butter ball. He wasn't in the shape he needed to be in. He listened. Is this from City when you yeah. He, no, 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 no. He'd, he'd come in. Sorry, he was with he, Eddie Howard. Brought him in. Right. And him and Ben me sort of combined. I think I can't okay. remember the truth. Uh, the whole story. Sorry, not yeah. the truth. I think they came in combined. Um, very talented young man. Just a bit loose and a bit, you know, but but he had a lovely edge about him. I love it. He's a little lo- lovable rogue. Not nothing, nothing terrible. Not in big trouble. And just got edge. You know what I mean? And I really loved it on him. And I just need to push him a little bit, cajole him a little. But he listened. So therefore, you build a real rapport. He did fantastic for us. Had an amazing time at Burnley before he went to Tottenham, and just always respected it. And and now and again, he'd ring me for advice, or he'd and we just sort of kept in touch. Got to know a couple of his mates and his family a little bit, you know what I mean? He got me tickets for the Euros and, and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So not all players are like that. And some are like it, but they they, they don't get as involved. Yeah. But he, he he still FaceTimes me now and again, rings me, you know. Um, all right, Gaffer, everything all right? You know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> I go, yeah, cool. What's happening, Trips? You know what I mean? Well, we know what your first signing will be if you can get him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, quick fire questions. And actually, I've go got on. your answer to this from three oh. years ago. What are the three non-negotiables that you and the people around you have to buy into? And I'm interested, after what you've been through and the break you've had, Um, whether they will be any different. um, Hard work would be one. I don't know if I said that last time, but hard work. Yeah. Um, What was the question again? Just Three non-negotiable behaviours. Behaviours. Hard work. I'd be surprised if that's not there. Um, one One that's changed only because of recently... And I know that I believe in it is alignment. You know, that's a key for me, aligning. Because yeah. when our alignment went wrong, that definitely affected the outcome of Burnley. You know, it started to yeah. go, you know what I mean? The straight line thinking throughout me, yeah. the staff, the players started to go, ooh. And I thought, so alignment, hard work, alignment. And I think probably I still go back to some things like honesty and trust. I think that yeah. would still be a big thing for me. Well, the previous ones were personal respect. Oh, respect. Yeah, that's close. That's, Professional that's respect honesty, to be fair. and a great attitude. Great attitude. And then you went, oh, actually, great attitude. That should be number one. 
yeah, so that's about right. So that sort of goes in with hard work, but a great attitude is everything. That was my Sunday league manager. Alignment's a very interesting one, though. And uh, and that almost needs to be the first consideration when you take the next job. Oh, I right? think we lost that over the la course of last season. Not mm. overnight, but I think mm. too many voices, too many different changes of feel, and yeah. I need this and I need that. So the true alignment started to waver. And you know, I don't know whether you've heard it, but we did a similar to this. We had a second conversation with Frank Lampard and he said exactly the same thing. He said that he didn't realise that the alignment at Chelsea was off. Mm. And as soon as the alignment was off, it was never well, going to we, be We success. built over time alignment from the board, through the management structure being me, through the scouting structure, through the playing structure, well, the staff, sorry, the playing structure. And it leaks into the fans, you see. So right. I mean, subliminal, they almost go, right, everything's in place. You know what I mean? I want some stories about, you know, oh, this is changed, that's changing, this changed, that's changing quite well. It starts changing, you know, and, and little funny little stories and little bits start coming back from players and agents. Now you start going, hmm. And we'd only had it once before, and that was the season I told you when we got into the uh, Europa League. Yeah. And at Christmas, it was out of line. And we had to strip it back and realign it and just say, right, the thing you've forgotten about is just working hard. Yep. That has to be a given for us. And we just started from that structure again and move forwards. Brilliant. What's your greatest strength and your biggest weakness? God, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm so arrogant. I don't think I've got many weaknesses. <laughs> um, weakness is probably a bit not, I, I'm not as, um, my staff tell me I could be a bit more grey at times. I tend to be like that. Black, yep, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. And not everything is black and white. So that's a weakness, I would say. It's strength in a way, obviously, like yeah. anything, yin and yang. Mm. Um, strength. That's a weird thing to answer because you feel weird about answering, but um, strength. Don't be so British. Come on. No, it's true. Um, I think sort of them things, fair, being pretty fa fair, being fair, respectful, yep. um, pretty grounded. I think yep. that's a key thing. I, my biggest strength is being authentic. Right. Perfect. I am like this. Whether me and you are chatting in the office having a coffee or whether we're chatting in front of the microphone or whether I'm chatting with my mates back home I grew up with or still hang around with or from when I was five years old, they're probably going to go, he's still the geezer that we've known since we were five. So in the spirit then of giving us hard feedback that we can take rather than the medium <laughs> feedback, what score would you rate this interview and what could we have done better? I've enjoyed it. I think I enjoyed the last one. I enjoyed the fact that it was more uh, into, you know, touching on the brands and I, but more the thing behind, the thing behind, I know it's called high performance, of course, but you know what I mean? The thing behind um, tactics and all that. Yeah. That's the bit I, I think this is really good at. I'm not just saying that, I really do think it is because there's a story behind, people go on a performance, they can go, oh yeah, but they, they won the league or something. You go, right, what's the story behind winning the league? And yeah. it's very rarely, as you both know, very rarely about tactics and all that. It's about the fabric of what you do, the the construct of what you do, the, the people are involved, the dynamic, the mind dynamic, the connection, all them things. And I think the fact that you try and unravel and speak about that, which is why I really enjoyed the first and I've enjoyed today, because that doesn't always get... And I know why, right? People love fluff, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They love it if I say something stupid about, you know, I wear this or wear that. And, uh, you know, we sat in a river because we had a spin wheel mm -hmm. and all them things. And they're all fine. <laughs> but at the end of the day, there's not that much substance on it. You know, this yeah. puts the meat on the bone yeah. a little bit. But then what could we have done better, Sean? We're, like, we're hungry for feedback. No, no, I don't think, I, I'll be honest, you know, because I, I'm not in your world, so I don't know it that well. You ask questions, they've got to be pertinent questions. They ask questions that can open up things, situation more clearly. Because that's what I think people want to. People want to. Well, people are into this sort of thing. I think, or I imagine, when I'm answering is they want to know a bit more depth to it. They want to know a bit more. What's the reality? You know, yeah. like I say, there's bits of fluff, and that can be really funny. And I could tell you a million silly little quips and funny stories and all that. I was telling someone the other day about the spin wheel and lap dances and all stuff like that. No, it's all good fun, and it kind of has its relevance, but. I think that, you know, when you're doing this sort of thing, I just think a bit more depth and a bit more meaning. It allows us the chance as the coaches to, to give it more, yeah. a bit more to it and a bit more depth to it. And that's a, not an easy thing. And, um, and your final point, really, for people listening to this, your final message, if you like, what would you describe the place you are now in your life? What is your one golden rule to living a high-performance life? Do you know what? I think it still goes back to 
hard work, great attitude. They're things that whatever you do, I, I, I swear by it. It's something yeah. that's served me well. I, you know, I'm not going to change certain things that I'm about, but still it'd be that and of being authentic. I think whatever you are, there's so much drivel. I, I, I was going to swear then, I won't swear, but there's so much BS out there now. Okay. Everyone's filling the, the airways full of, you know, certain mm. special clever words and clever sayings and all that. And you need to do a bit of that because you don't get any buy-in unless you do it. But some of it, you're like, come on. You know what I mean? You, you know, just be yourself. I think personally, I think that's a key thing. And with you, with you, I'm a bit Marmite, so myself is not, every, not everyone thinks I'm, you know, what I think I am, which is great. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I think that's, but, but being authentic, really I think enjoyable. that's the key. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for the Thanks, insight. Sean. And thank Pleasure. you for the substance behind the stories. It's, it's really enlightening for people. No, really, really cool. Really enjoyed it. Top man. Thank you, mate. Well done. Thank you very much, Sean. The life of a Premier League football manager. Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.